17th 2024 afternoon session of the Portland City Council 
Uh, Keelan, is that you in the clerk's position today? It's Rebecca. Rebecca, good afternoon, Rebecca. Please call the roll. Brian? Here. Gonzalez? Here. Apps? Here. Rubio? Here. Wheeler? Here. And now we'll hear from legal counsel and the rules of order and decorum. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council, in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. All right, thanks. Up. Uh, first up, 319, a resolution. Accept 2023 deadly traffic crash report and the Vision Zero Action Plan update 2023 through 2025 and direct cross bureau collaboration to deliver a safer system. Colleagues, our next item accepts the 2023 deadly traffic crash report, the Vision Zero Action Plan update for 2023 through 2025, and it directs cross bureau collaboration to deliver safer systems. Vision Zero presents our city's unwavering commitment to ensure that everyone in our city can travel safely, guaranteeing that our loved ones return home each day. That's the goal. This initiative stands firmly on the principle that the loss of life in daily commutes is entirely unacceptable. Despite the challenges that lie ahead, our dedication to achieving Vision Zero remains unwavering. I've witnessed the transformative power of decisive actions leading to safer outcomes on our street. The impactful advocacy over many years, spanning from community members to safety advocates and yes, elected officials, culminated in the jurisdictional transfer of 82nd Avenue, one of our city's most hazardous routes. This significant change has enabled PBOT to implement crucial safety enhancements that will undoubtedly save lives. While the progress on 82nd Avenue is commendable, traffic safety extends beyond transportation concerns alone. Relying solely on PBOT, in my opinion, will not suffice to eliminate traffic-related deaths and serious injuries. Our city faces interconnected crises, addiction, behavioral health, housing, amongst others, all exacerbated by the pandemic and contributing to the uptick in traffic fatalities here as well as across the country. In early 2022, I issued an emergency declaration to tackle the danger posed by campsites situated within high crash corridors in Portland. This emergency order, which is still in effect, serves three purposes. It prohibits camping along high-speed corridors to enhance safety. It directs the impact reduction team, or IRP, to prioritize posting and removing camps in these critical areas. And it ensures that these sites remain clear of camps. Last month, IRP cleared 110 camps located at or near intersections identified as part of a high crash network. I'd like to take a moment to thank the state legislature for greatly increasing funding to clean ODOT right of ways, many dangerous, many along high, dangerous high crash corridors. This funding, which this city council lobbied hard for, has allowed IRP to expand their contracting capacity in critical areas, leading to increased people power on the ground. It is essential to foster collaboration across various city bureaus to address these multifaceted societal issues that affect street safety every day. Strategic investments in housing, in social services, in traffic enforcement, in emergency response, and in smart land use policies are vital to advancing our traffic safety goals. Achieving Vision Zero necessitates 
a collective effort from multiple bureaus. I'm proud to co-sponsor this resolution with Commissioner Maps and appreciate his leadership and the leadership from all bureaus involved today in pushing this initiative forward. Commissioner Maps was put into a tough leadership role when I assigned him PBOT. I knew that some of these challenges will exist, would exist, and I want to thank Commissioner Maps and his team, as well as PBOT leadership, for leaning into these challenges and working with the community to help resolve them. Together, with unified efforts and sustained commitment, we will continue to make strides towards a safer Portland. I'll now turn this over to Commissioner Maps. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, colleagues. Um, the item before us today comes from PBOT and the Mayor's Office. We are here this afternoon to accept the 2023 Deadly Traffic Crash Report and the Vision Zero Action Plan Update for 2023-2025. I want to start off by thanking the Mayor for co-sponsoring this resolution. The Mayor's partnership here reflects the fact that ensuring road safety requires collaboration and cooperation among many city bureaus, our partners at the county, nonprofits, and the public. The presentation we will hear today reflects this truth. Uh, today we will hear from PBOT, the Police Bureau, the Fire Bureau, uh, folks from Planning and Sustainability, our partners from Multnomah County, our partners uh, in the community like uh, Division Midway Alliance and Oregon Walks. Uh, colleagues, before we get into today's presentation, I want to share um, an experience I had walking into this meeting today. Uh, just outside this room, a reporter buttonholed me and asked, uh, Commissioner, is Vision Zero working? Well, here's the answer to that question. Where we have invested, we have had success. For example, uh, the safety speed cameras on Portland streets have achieved a 94% reduction in the people speeding more than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And by the end of this year, we will have more than doubled the number of cameras on Portland streets compared to just last year. Um, that action is one of just, or more than 30 actions that uh, PBOT and frankly, the rest of this council are moving forward with. You'll uh, see those actions in our Vision Zero Action Plan update, which we will learn about uh, today shortly. Um, I want you to know that I'm committed to taking a safety system approach to traffic safety. This approach focuses on, amongst other things, reducing speeds, designing our roads so that they reduce the severity of crashes when crashes do occur, and building a culture of shared responsibility for the safety of ourselves and others. Now, here today to tell us more about this work, we have PBOT Director Millicent Williams, who is joined by Dana Dickman, PBOT's uh, Safety Section Manager. Uh, I want to thank Director Williams for joining us today, Dana too, and I will turn the floor over to you too. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mayor Wheeler. Thank you, Commissioner Maps, And uh, thank you to all of the commissioners who are here assembled. I'd uh, like to especially thank uh, Commissioner Gonzalez for the challenge of uh, beating him here today as he is, was a pedestrian and I was a motorist. Um, the only reason that I didn't win is because I had to find a parking space and thank goodness all of them were filled and I hope that people are paying for the parking that they're using. So, um, <laughs> quick departure, but I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. For the record, I am Millicent Williams. I am the director of the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Mayor Wheeler, I am deeply appreciative that you have co-sponsored this resolution. That partnership illustrates the breadth of work we need to make progress on Vision Zero. Upholding our commitment to eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries is one of my top priorities. As the entity responsible for the management and monitoring of and maintenance of Portland streets, PBOT has the leading role and responsibility to design, build, and maintain streets that support safe travel citywide. Making safe streets is a cornerstone of the city's commitment to Vision Zero. Safe streets are also crucial for the city to reduce carbon emissions. 
to deliver on our commitment to racial equity and to fulfill our responsibility to create a livable city for everyone. Portland's high crash corridors, the 30 streets with the highest number of deadly and serious injury crashes, cut across our city and through our neighborhoods. We all interact with these streets. A Vision Zero approach means that we will continue to transform streets that were built to move vehicles quickly into streets that move people safely. Where we have invested in safety, as the commissioner has mentioned, we have seen success. On average, we have achieved a 72% reduction in top end speeding, defined as traveling more than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, on streets where we have converted travel lanes to center turn lanes with pedestrian islands, bike lanes, and bus lanes. PBOT has delivered dozens of these types of road redesign projects that have improved safety for everyone, no matter how they choose to travel. Here are the types of projects that PBOT will continue to lead. Our upcoming projects will transform 82nd Avenue, 122nd Avenue, Northeast Halsey Street, Southwest 4th Avenue downtown, and Southeast Stark Washington Couplet in East Portland. We know that a major capital project can make a big difference, but we also know that they require significant funding and they can take years to design and build. As you'll hear about in this presentation, there are smaller and quicker investments that can also make a difference. For instance, we can change traffic signals at intersections and clear corners to add visibility on the high crash network. These are proven crash reduction strategies that do not require the same scale of investment as transformative capital projects, yet they still require investments. If our fiscal year 24-25 budget is approved as submitted, we will be able to make more of these small scale, high value investments. Delivering Vision Zero solutions requires intricately woven systems and processes. The delivery of a safer street or functioning speed safety camera relies not only on construction, but also critically on back-end services, including procurement, contracting, and financial services. We also know that PBOT cannot do this work alone. Street design is critical, but it is not the only solution. There are complex reasons behind the rise of traffic fatalities, and tackling the issue requires a whole city and truly a whole community approach. For that reason, I'm pleased that my colleagues from other partner bureaus and agencies are here today to support our city's commitment to Vision Zero. First, PBOT is grateful for the attention to this issue today. Up next, we'll hear from one of our PBOT experts, someone who deals with these deadly and serious injury crashes on a daily basis. Dana Dickman, our safety section manager, will share more about the report, the action plan, and resolution that are here before you today. Dana. Thank you so much, Director Williams. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here with us today and being willing to dig into this very somber work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, you already have gone over what the resolution is today. I will give a high-level summary of what's in the traffic crash report. You have the documents in front of you. You can ask questions or follow up later. We'll summarize, and then we'll talk more about the continued collaboration that we want to see. Next slide, please. I'm gonna just start the presentation by really addressing the elephant in the room. And Commissioner Maps, you brought this up. We are often asked, is Vision Zero working? As we see the number rise, that is the question, is it working? And my clear and pointed answer is yes, it is working when we have been able to make changes on our streets. If you go out and you see a street that hasn't changed at all in 10 years, we're not gonna to expect to see different safety outcomes than we've had over the last few decades. So recognizing, again, where we invest, we see those changes to safety outcomes. I'm just gonna share a couple of examples of where we've been able to do that. On Southeast Hawthorne, we had a maintenance project planned and we were able to go in and really look at what are the safety changes we can make here on this street. We reconfigured the roadway from a four lane cross section to a three lane. We added 10 pedestrian islands, we added lighting, and we're seeing significant safety improvements. We're also seeing faster buses. And as someone who actually lives in Southeast Portland, I've talked to business owners, I've talked to my neighbors, and I hear people say how much better it is just to cross the street and how much more comfortable they are navigating around what is a very vibrant business district. 
Southeast Beaverton Hills Darrell Highway. That's a bit of an older project. We have multiple years of data, so we can actually see the crash reductions. We put in a speed camera. We put in a protected bikeway and pedestrian way in a section. We reconfigured the lanes, and we're seeing a 70% crash reduction in that section of Beaverton Hillsdale Highway. So again, these are kind of small segments of, these, of the whole high crash network, but where we've been able to invest and where we've been able to change the street design, we are seeing Vision Zero work. And Vision Zero as a program and as a commitment that the city made in 2015 has allowed us to move forward with these projects. I'll just add one more thing from this slide. Outer Division is a relatively new safety project. We only have about a year of data, so we don't have a full evaluation of it yet. But we do have a, a survey that we went out and talked to community members over the last year about how they were feeling since the project was completed. And 60% of respondents say that the project has had a positive or very positive impact on safety. And that, that's very meaningful to us. Like, not only are we seeing some changes changes as we just go out and observe, but community is saying like, yes, this project had a positive impact. I know you all have heard a lot about that project. <laughs> so we wanted to share this point with you that people are feeling that it is um, moving in the right direction. Next slide, please. Now I'm just going to jump into what's in the fatal crash report. Again, this is a report that we do every year. Um, at the end of the year to document really what happened in the previous year with our fatal crashes. In 2023, we had 69 people die on our streets in fatal crashes. That was 64 crashes, so we had a couple of crashes with multiple fatalities. This is the highest number in three decades. We can see that things are going in the wrong direction. Next slide, please. We're not alone in this situation. We talk to peer cities all over the country that are also seeing this spike in crashes since 2020. The slide that you are looking at has 30-year trend lines for Portland, for the state of <coughs> Oregon, and for the US. You can see at the end of that line in 2020, those, all those lines are rising. Things have changed. We all know that we're living in a sort of fundamentally changed city. That's bearing out in the crash data as well. Next slide, please. So now I'm just going to go over kind of like who and where and what's contributing to crashes. In 2023, I'll, I'll just say that we say preliminary 2023 data because this is just the fatal crash data and we get the final data from ODOT about 18 months to 24 months after the year has closed. So these are the numbers that we have worked on with our police partners. Last year, uh, people in vehicles represented the greatest number of people killed in traffic crashes. That's 32 of the 69 crashes. The number of pedestrians actually went down slightly from 2022. We had 24 pedestrians that were killed as compared to 28 in 2022. We continue to see a disproportionate number of people killed on motorcycles, and we had two bicyclists that were killed last year in traffic crashes. A couple of points that I want to bring up as concerning trends we have been fortunate in Portland to not see many people 18 and younger being killed in traffic crashes over the last 10 years. However, last year we had seven youth 18 and under killed in traffic crashes. They were all either driving or passengers in motor vehicles. Again, one year does not make a trend, but that is a deeply concerning data point from the last year. For the, since 2020, we have tracked uh, the housing status of folks killed in traffic crashes. Last year, 13 people were unhoused at the time of their death. 12 of those were pedestrians. One person was bicycling. So that's 50% of our pedestrian crashes were unhoused at the time of their death. Next slide, please. So where are these crashes happening? Um, as you heard Millicent say, we have a high crash network that was developed as part of our original Vision Zero work. It's 30 corridors. Last year, 74% of our traffic deaths happened on the high crash network, and it's only 8% of our streets. The graphic that you're viewing shows those, um, those networks, but what you'll probably know when you, when you look at our city, it's really the wide parts of those streets and those corridors, the four or more lanes where we're seeing the crashes. So it extends across the whole city, but it's really outer division or outer Stark where we're seeing those crashes. You'll notice the, the data points on the slide. 
over 50% of our crashes were on those places where we have four or more travel lanes. That's only 4% of our streets. 80% of the traffic deaths were on streets with speeds posted at 30 miles per hour or higher. If you look at the graphic, you can see the small circles that show our highest crash intersections in the city. You'll notice that they are predominantly in the east part of our city. People in East Portland are dying at one and a half times the rate compared to the rest of Portland. Next slide, please. So what are some of the trends that are contributing to those crash patterns? Um, again, at least 40 people last year, we know speeding was involved. We have an additional 20 crashes that we just don't have the full investigation yet, and we're still looking at it, but at least 40 of those crashes, speed or speeding was um, part of the crash. At least 19 of the traffic deaths involved an impaired driver. Again, we'll have to wait for full data um, to understand if that number rises, but we suspect it will. 77% of our traffic deaths occurred in dark conditions. These are not new trends. These are things that we've been working on. We know that speed, impairment, and dark conditions are contributing to traffic crashes in Portland and have been. Next slide, please. So what's different? Why are we seeing 20 more crashes in 2023 than we saw in 2019? Some of those trends are continuing, but one of the things we're seeing since 2020, as we've seen this spike um, in the last three years, is excessive speed in a majority of crashes. And when I say excessive speed, what I'm talking about is highway speeds on local streets. We're talking about 30 miles, 40 miles an hour over the speed limit. We have an, a number of increase in people driving off the roadway and hitting fixed objects. So again, speed is a contributor to whether or not that happens, whether or not there's a roadway departure and the severity of the crash if you do leave the roadway. We have seen an increase in other crimes or incidences pre preceding fatal crashes. So gun violence or other crimes being connected <laughs> to our fatal crashes. An increase in street racing events and individuals racing. We see a number of crashes where it's not just during an event, which we have had fatalities during those, but also just two vehicles racing each other and it's led to a fatal crash. <coughs> Erratic and unpredictable behavior for all road users. This is that, that change in the city that we're all feeling. People out in the right of way, out in our streets, they're angry, they're impaired, they're experiencing mental health crises, all of these things are contributing to fatal crashes. And we see an increased exposure of houseless community members. If you're out on the street 24 hour a day, the increased risk of, being, of having an incident with traffic violence, it's just, it, it would be true for any of us if we were out on the street 24 hours a day. We're also seeing pedestrians moving and crossing and traveling along freeways, so controlled access roadways, that then there ends up um, a crash. So those are different trends. Those are not things that we were seeing regularly. I mean, we might see one or two of those types of crashes previous to 2020, but now we're seeing that all of these things are happening and we're seeing multiples in a year. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna jump in a little bit to the Vision Zero Action Plan. When we review um, an update to the action plan, what you're seeing is, again, an update to our 2017 adopted plan. We've adopted approximately um, two or accepted approximately two since our original adoption. This update to the plan really sustains our commitment that no person should die or be incapacitated from simply going about their day in Portland. When we updated this plan, we not only do the review like we, you just went over with a 2023, we look at five years of data and 10 years of data, but our focus was on the data from 2017 to 2021. And we look at the trends, the types of crashes that are happening, where they're happening, and develop specific actions that PBOT is gonna work on to address those types of crashes. Within the action plan, we have 35 specific things that we're working on over the next two years. It's not everything that we're working on in safety, but it's the specific work to address uh, the crashes and traffic fatalities. We use a safe systems approach, which really recognizes um, that in street design, we have to include or recognize human failability and the physics of 
all the different users out in the right in the right of way. So that is also including, again, the whole approach of thinking about behavior change, safe people, safe streets, safe speeds, and also post crash response. Next slide, please. As we look at that data and everything that you've heard, we do have some priorities within the Vision Zero Action Plan. We focus on designing safe streets to protect human lives. That can be some of the corridor re redesigns that Director Williams mentioned. It can also be something as simple as um, clearing a corner, or it has a range of things that we're doing to protect people as we're designing streets. Because pedestrians are disproportionately represented, for the last 10 years, really, in our crash data, we have specific uh, initiatives to focus on protecting pedestrians in the right-of-way. Again, that can be a median refuge island. It can be a pedestrian head start at an intersection. It can also be education and outreach. We have a specific focus on reducing sp speed citywide, and this is a str strategic plan that touches many different areas of our work. That's the speed cameras that the commissioner mentioned. It's reducing posted speed limits. It's working with our partners at police on um, enforcing for speed. It's all different elements, but the, the focus of it is on reducing speeds overall in the city. Again, really recognizing the physics of the situation, that if we are in an urban area, we have people walking, biking, turning, walking or being in a wheelchair, anything moving on our streets, that if you have a vehicle that's moving more than 30 miles per hour and there is an incident, it's not going to end well. So we need to reduce speeds systemically. The last piece is really about safe people. It's about the users of the roadway. It's about us all taking responsibility and really creating that culture of shared responsibility so that's focused education, again, partnering on enforcement, and lots of other partnerships and prevention strategies that we focus on within the action plan. Next slide, please. The next two slides are just showing a little bit more about the initiatives. The data really tells us where to go in the action plan. We know that the high crash network is a place that we need to invest. Again, in 2023, 74% of our crashes were on the high crash network. Since 2017, we've spent, PBOT has spent 193 million on the high crash network, which sounds like a massive number. <laughs> It is a massive number. It represents a ton of work. But just per, for the perspective, like you are all are very aware of how much we're spending on 82nd. And we're going to see a huge improvement in safety, but $185 million still isn't enough to fully transform the street. So I say that just for perspective and the level of investment that we need to see transformation and really get us to zero. This list projects that we've recently completed on the high crash network, areas that are under construction, 82nd is one of them, and we have many more projects that are slated to start construction in 2024 and multiple other corridors that are in project development or in design right now. Next slide, please. In addition to those big corridor projects, as Millicent mentioned, we have the opportunity to improve safety with focused systemic changes. So smaller initiatives, things that are focused on the types of crashes that we are having or high risk areas in the city. Clearing corners is one of the things that we can do. Adding protected left turns at intersections or pedestrian head starts. Looking at specific speed limit reductions or traffic calming. These are all areas of like tactical um, investment that are typically programmatic and not part of our capital budget and require that continued investment. Next slide, please. So how are we gonna achieve a safe system? How are we going to achieve zero? I believe that eliminating traffic fatalities is possible. We've seen it around the globe. We know that where there's investment, this is possible. When we look at PBOT's responsibility, we know that we need to transform our streets. If you're looking at this graphic, it's, it's essentially a graphic representation of the elements that we need to deliver on as a city in order to eliminate traffic fatalities. 
that orange segment, that's like, that's PBOT's bread and butter. That's street design change, that's speed limit reduction. That's where we have the responsibility to do this work and where we have the most ability to make an impact. Freedom to get around without driving, that's partnership on land use, transit, development, business engagement. PBOT has a role to play, but it's not our lead necessarily. And then as we move into the black and blue segments, in order to achieve zero, zero fatalities, we really need to look at mental health services. We need to have access to housing. We need to have substance abuse um, services. And those are not places where PBOT has a strong role. We can definitely collaborate. We can be a partner. But these are areas in community where we need to come together in order to achieve this goal of zero. Next slide, please. So again, this kind of comes to the reason for the resolution. We wanted to make sure that you all had the time to dig into the fatal crash report and the Vision Zero Action Plan. But really, it's about bringing us together to recognize that the city has changed, that the types of crashes that we're seeing have changed, and that it is going to need a multidisciplinary, multi-bureau approach to increase safety on our streets. The slide you have in front of you just has some examples of ways that we're already collaborating. Things like doing a review of uh, traffic safety or access to new shelter locations, or um, working with uh, Portland Fire and Rescue on speed reductions in a way that doesn't impede emergency vehicles. Those are places where we're already collaborating, but there's many more that we need to engage on, and that's what um, this—that's what the resolution is about, and that's what Director Williams is taking on next. I'll turn it back over to you to introduce our partners. Hey, thank you so much, Dana. Uh, as you can see, meeting our safety outcomes and truly getting to zero is going to require more than the elements in PBOT's portfolio. We are not abdicating our responsibility, but we know that we have an outsized responsibility in this area. We need deep partnerships and culture change across disciplines, and we need to bring all partners necessary. I'd like to thank my colleagues. With their presence today, it shows that you are leaning into this to be a partner in solving this problem. I'm pleased that we are joined today by some of our partners, and I'd like to ask that Deputy Chief Frome uh, from the Portland Police Bureau come forward to share uh, invited testimony, and additional uh, testimony will be coming from Chief Gillespie, uh, Director Oliveira, Multnomah County uh, Director of Community Services, Margie Bradway, uh, a representative from Division Midway Alliance, Lisa Shrish, Shrish excuse me, Shrish, I'm sorry for butchering your name, and then from Oregon Walks, Zachary Lawrenson. Deputy Chief. Sure is working? Right, I think up. mine's on now. There you go. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, thank you for letting me be here today. Um, but first, I'd like to thank Director uh, Williams for her leadership and partnership with the Portland Police Bureau over um, the last, I don't know, it's been a while, but I do appreciate you greatly. So, um, you know, we're committed to be a partner with PBOT on this. We've been a long time a Vision Zero partner. The work of our traffic division is grounded in traffic safety. Our traffic division is not what it used to be. I think we all know that. Um, we are taking steps to try to improve that. Um, the traffic division recently came up with a, a couple of ways that we can help improve that. We have a rotation policy that's been put in place where officers from our precincts are able to go spend some time back at the traffic division, uh, get back up to speed on how to process intoxicated drivers, get to be more comfortable in doing um, crash investigation work. Uh, that will help us develop a culture where traffic is prioritized. And in addition to that, we also have the ability to have our trainees, and we have a lot of trainees in the pipeline, uh, rotate through the traffic division to get exposed to that. Um, that was something we used to do 25 years ago when I got hired. I'm glad that we're doing it again. Um, we have focused our traffic enforcement resources to maximize safety benefits and reduce preventable traffic deaths. 
We focus enforcement on our highest crash corridors. Those are the greatest safety needs and that account for more than half of our deadly crashes. We ensure that enforcement along these high crash networks are spread across the city to ensure all areas get the benefit of safer streets without carrying the burden of over enforcement. We focus our enforcement on the most dangerous behaviors like speeding, impaired driving, and red light running to emphasize for community members how dangerous these behaviors are. We want people traveling in Portland to understand the impacts of their choices, uh, not just on themselves, but on others, and make safe choices today and into the future. We will continue to collaborate with PBOT and our other partner bureaus to educate community members and work to prevent deadly and serious injury crashes in Portland. Um, that's my official comments, but I'd like to just take a moment and go off script a little bit here and just a, a personal story. Uh, I live on a high crash location within the city of Portland. Uh, over the last year, um, Peabot worked with our neighborhood association to do some really simple um, modifications to a problematic intersection that every so often I had a vehicle flipped over in the sidewalk in front of my house. Uh, since those have gone in, nothing, all right? Speed on the street is still a little high. That's my problem. I need to order the traffic guys to come out to <laughs> do some more work on that. Um, but the cross, they were able to identify the fact that it was just a bad crossing location. And so we prevent north-south travel along one of the streets at that intersection. This is the type of work that Peabody does all the time. This is the type of work that I know that they get immediate resistance from neighbors because nobody wants to change the way they drive, but it saves lives. And so I just encourage everyone, work with Peabot, give it a chance. You're going to see results. Thanks. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler, City Commissioners. My name is Ryan Gillespie, Fire Chief for Portland Fire and Rescue. I'd like to thank Director Williams and our Peabot leadership team for inviting me today as a representative of Portland Fire and Rescue to say a few words. We have a strong partnership with PBOT, and we share the same goal of saving lives in the city of Portland. Our emergency responders witness and experience firsthand the impacts of serious crashes. We understand the horrific outcomes that high speeds can have <clears throat> on the severity of a crash, the consequences of drug and alcohol, and the disproportionate impact to communities within Portland. There's oftentimes a philosophical conflict between reducing speeds through street design and maintaining open streets to support fast response times. As you are all aware, time is of the essence in our line of work where every second counts and delays in response time can lead to poor outcomes for those who have experienced a significant emergency. However, I want to stress again, PBOT and Portland Fire and Rescue share the same goal. We strive to provide safety for all Port Portlanders. At Portland Fire and Rescue, we are committed to continuing to work closely with our PBOT partners. We will work together to ensure that street designs contribute to safe outcomes for our community and also meet the needs of first responders, allowing rapid access to emergencies when they occur. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and thank you for the time. Thanks, Chief. Chief. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Donnie Oliveira, Director of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for the record. Uh, first, I want to start by uh, appreciating Director Williams and her team for their leadership on this important topic. Um, as you all know, our city's livability, safety, equity, and climate commitments are all inextricably connected. To reach our climate targets, we must tackle the 40% of climate emissions that come from the transportation sector. And to do so, we must see a shift to carbon light or carbon free travel modes. And inherent in that shift is that people must feel those options are safe and accessible. As mentioned in the staff presentation, we need continued integration of transportation and land use planning to build communities that allow more people to live closer to jobs, goods, and services. So we designed our city with the idea that our neighborhood should be walkable, vibrant, and amenity rich. And by investing and implementing in 20 minute neighborhoods and transit oriented development, we are inherently supporting the urban form needed to save lives on Portland streets. A 2017 study found that vehicle miles traveled and vehicles per capita are the strongest indicators of traffic uh, death rates in cities. The study punctuates that less driving is not only good for personal health and climate, but is critical to eliminate preventable traffic deaths. At its core, Vision Zero is about people. Our successes around re redesigning safe streets to protect our people has co-benefits with our climate goals. When we make low carbon travel options safe, accessible and convenient for all Portlanders, we are creating an abundance of modal choice and making low carbon travel options the more attractive option to take in the first place. 
and in that BPS is committed partner in, to this vision. Uh, like the Deputy Chief, I'd like to share a moment that happened to me today. I have a 10, six-year-old. They are avid bike riders, and today was uh, bike to school day, bike bus day at the school we attend. And there's a noticeable difference when my, my kids are traveling on roads that have protected bike lanes and safe spaces for them to bike. They're more confident. They're thriving in that space. And when we take their bikes uh, out on the weekends in spaces that maybe not so safe, I can see the difference in their behavior and their demeanor, and rightfully so. It can be scary as a six-year-old on a little bike with fast-moving traffic. But seeing the improvements around my neighborhood that Peabot has made in the last five years, it's made a notable difference in our community and how they show up uh, on bikes and, and, and in our parks. So I want to thank Peabot for their leadership in that and just point to a, as a user of our city streets that it's a welcome addition to, to our, our livable communities. And with that, I just want to further uh, commit to working with Peabot, their leadership on improving our streets, making them safer, and also abundantly rich in modal options. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Hi, Mayor Wheeler, uh, commissioners. Thank you for having, uh, counselors, excuse me. Thank you for having me here today. I'm Margie Bradway. I am the Director of Community Services at Multnomah County. Um, thank you, Peabot. Thank you, city, for having the county here today. We are a strong partner in this effort. Traffic safety is an issue that is near and dear to my heart. Um, also, the chair, Chair Vega Peterson, um, has been working on traffic safety issues for many years in her career. Um, and the county really um, is disheartened by the way the numbers are going. We partner with the city to track those numbers, and we see a real intersection between safety and equity in East Multnomah County. Um, so we know traffic deaths are preventable. Our colleagues, my colleagues in the Multnomah County Health Department did a study um, just last year. You may have seen the report, and they found that ten, uh, two out of five crashes are due to excessive speed. So we know we have to focus on speed. Um, as the PBOT staff said, uh, that speed can be reduced by system changes, infrastructure changes on your streets. Um, the county is more than willing to partner with the city on those arterials and high crash corridors that go between the city and the county roads and the cities of East Multnomah County. We also know that lowering the speed uh, helps. And, and with that, we are supportive of all the measures the city takes to lower speeds on our roads. Um, but we know system changes take time. I know that. I oversee you know, our transportation department. So we are also in support of automated enforcement in that effort. Um, and that's something that we know works, as the PBOT staff said. Um, Multnomah County, we play a role in facilitating discussions with the cities out in East Portland. We convene the uh, MUCTUC, which is the East Multnomah County Transportation Committee. That includes Fairview, Gresham, Wood Village, Troutdale, but it also includes the city of Portland. And we are working on an action plan uh, for East Multnomah County, identifying roadways that cross all jurisdictions where we can make investments at the where the highest crashes are located. So we appreciate your collaboration on that. We appreciate your work in East County, and um, we are willing partners moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I believe next we have some of our community partners from the Division Midway Alliance and Oregon Walks. Please come on up. Water for us, even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, Alicia. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and Councillors. Uh, for the record, I am Alicia Shrestha, Executive Director of Division Midway Alliance. I'm glad to be here today to speak about Division Midway Alliance partnership with PBOT in implementing Vision Zero programs. Division Midway Alliance serves community and businesses that live and work in one of the city's high crash corridor areas. With a mission to create socially and economically resilient, safer and healthier East Portland community, we have been implementing community-driven programs and culturally specific services for our community. And transportation equity program is one of the six major programs within our organization. 
Through this program, we provide culturally specific engagement on transportation safety education and organize transportation resource event. Out of the several transportation engagement that we do uh, through our partnership with PBOT, Metro, ODOT, and PBOT, I would like to focus on the recent PBOT Beyond Traffic Safety Focus Group we conducted with PBOT in May 2023. We engage and facilitate focus groups with 40 community members from six different community groups to learn about the safety issues they are facing while in public places, walking and accessing transit. This engagement is foundation for co-creating a report beyond traffic safety, building community belonging and safety in public spaces. The key highlight of this report is personal safety toolkit, a, a guide on community-based solutions, which shares some practical steps that can make people feel safer in public spaces. We will be releasing this report in May 2024, and we are working with Vision Zero team, including Clay and her amazing team. We look forward to collaborating with PBOT to incorporate the tools community members identified into Vision Zero priority projects like 122nd Avenue. As we aim to build a safe transportation system, especially with communities in East Portland, we need creative partnerships like this one that integrate personal safety elements into safe street projects and neighborhood events. Our 2023 community visioning report echoes the voices from diverse community members about the need of critical investment in East Portland communities. And we heard about this, uh, you know, the need of investment earlier from uh, Commissioner Maps and uh, who spoke earlier. So investment is very critical in East Portland communities. So uh, access to safer public spaces and transit improved sidewalks is one of the five major priorities identified by community at the community visioning uh, session. Therefore, DMA is looking forward to work with PBOD in implementing the recommendations and make East Portland Street safer for pedestrians, drivers, and for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Zach, you're up. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the mayor and councilors. My name is Zachary Lauritsen. I'm at Ped Oregon Walks. We're a pedestrian advocacy organization. Uh, Vision Zero is near and dear to our heart. We were one of the organizations that were fighting for this about a decade ago. So thank you for, for uh, inviting me here. I want to start by echoing uh, something that Mayor Wheeler said. To start with, we know that the problem of traffic violence is not just a transportation problem. Um, we've heard uh, Director Williams talked about this, Director Oliveira talked about this, Ms. Dickman flagged it as well, uh, that we cannot solve the problem uh, just through, um, and we can't solve congestion, uh, just through transportation solutions. We need to rethink and intentionally zone and invest, um, incentivize development that gives people options so they are not fo forced to drive every day long distances at high speeds to get to their, their needs. So I just wanna flag that. Um, Mayor Wheeler also mentioned a few days ago uh, during council, uh, there's been a lot on your plate these last few years, right? We know this, right? Around COVID, around fentanyl use, around houselessness. Um, and there's good reasons that, that those have been your focus. Um, and yet here we are today, right? Here we are today. Um, our organization wants to be excited and supportive um, here, um, but I also wanna be really honest. Um, the reality about deaths and injuries on our streets is not a surprise. Uh, we've seen the numbers go up and up and up every year for many years. And if today turns out to be an inflection point and change, we will be thrilled. Um, but as an advocate, I, I want to note uh, that we've been here before. We've been at somber events. We've been at memorials uh, where we say the work is important, that we say that it's critical, that loss of life is terrible. And yet, you know, here we are again today. I wanna share just two things. Uh, the first one is uh, that there are loads of stakeholders as have been noted multiple times today by the people who have come and, and spoken today. Um, housing partners need to get housing units on, on, on online, temporary and long-term, so that we have fewer of our brothers and sisters living on the streets, right? Um, we need uh, fewer high-speed drivers and unregistered vehicles. Uh, we need fewer red light runners, like we all, we know that. We need our restaurants and our bars to get on board and, and keep people from getting in their car after they're intoxicated. Um, we need our, our emergency response folks to be able to get to um, spaces and work with PBOT, as has been noted today, about safe infrastructure that is also emergency resilient. The second angle I, I wanna um, bring up 
Um, it's about infrastructure, and it's that we continue to accept wide, high-speed roads that cut through our community. The Starks of the world, the 80 seconds of the world, the 120 seconds of the world, the Powells of the world, we continue to accept those in our uh, community. And so if we're serious about fewer people dying on our streets, I would argue uh, that we need fewer miles of super high speed, straight wide roads cutting through our neighborhoods, if we're serious about it. So um, I think we should give, and our organization thinks we should give, and someone who I really appreciate <laughs> thinks we should give more space to pedestrians and buses and to bike riders so that we give people opportunities to travel in other ways. I just want to really, really flag that. And I'm guessing, um, probably you're thinking that people do need to get around, which they do, and you probably get a ton of calls when congestion is bad. So I want to note that I, I recognize that. Um, and yet, the status quo is these deaths and these injuries, and I hope that we don't accept that status quo. And I hope that we make the changes that takes bravery, that takes leadership, that takes communication. As the chief noted, uh, the first reaction for many of your constituents is going to be frustration to change. That's real. Um, but we, we, all of us, we need to communicate that wide high-speed highways through our neighborhood is not good for us. It's not good for our kids. It's not good for our businesses. It's not good for our communities. And we can make a change. We have the power to make a change in our community. So, and I just want to note three opportunities. They're coming down the pipeline. Here we go. Number one, we could advocate on 82nd Avenue that the outer lanes are given to bus rapid transit. It's the highest ridership line in the whole system. And we could say, hey, we honor you transit riders. We're going to give you the outer lanes on 82nd. We're going to slow that down and we're going to highlight transit. Number two, Sandy. That's in the future too. Sandy could be like Foster. Could have a road diet, could slow down, could become a vibrant place. Um, Sandy is an opportunity to put bike lanes and transit lanes that really change the nature of that space. And the third one is Cesar, Cesar Chavez. It could be restriped tomorrow. Well, it can be tomorrow, but it could happen sooner rather than later. So it's not a high-speed corridor cutting through neighborhoods, um, and instead it's a slower space for people. It's a matter of priorities, and I hope we prioritize people um, instead of just vehicles cutting through our neighborhoods. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Zachary. Uh, colleagues, I believe that completes the invited testimony that we have today. I'm sure there are questions in the room. I also believe that we might have a few uh, members of the public who are signed up to testify. We have four people signed up. All right, uh, if there are no objections, why don't we go to public testimony now? Lynn Felton. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. My name's Lynn Felton. I'm with the Park Rose Argay Opportunity Coalition. Mayor, commissioners, I'm grateful to see in the Vision Zero Action Plan that the deadly road that is 122nd will continue to be a focal point. In December 2023 alone, five people died in crashes on 122nd. In the Vision Zero 2022 report, it was the sixth deadliest road for pedestrians in the city. We know for a fact this road is deadly. Yet the city of Portland has taken actions that increases the deadly risk for students at Park Rose High School and Middle School who must cross 122nd to get to school. The city of Portland permitted on 122nd a 250,000 square foot, 37 bay, pro lodges freight warehouse across from Park Rose High School's playing fields. PBOT allowed driveway extension 22-131-685 that widens the driveway, allowing 18 wheel trucks to enter the freight warehouse off of Northeast 122nd. This creates a traffic pattern of trucks traveling through the crosswalks students use at Northeast Shaver and Northeast Skidmore. We know from this report that heavier vehicles increases the probability of death in a crash. Why increase that risk next to schools? We know from this report that speed kills. 16, over 16% 16 of the 13,000 vehicles traveling through these crosswalks are traveling at a speed over 40 miles per hour according to the latest traffic count. We know that pedestrians have already died at and near these crosswalks. 
Ian Stagel, 2022, Northeast Shaver. Catherine Lita, 2023, Northeast Skidmore. Deadly, grim, heartbreaking statistics. Yet what has been done? Repeated accommodations for a multi-billion dollar out-of-state REIT, ProLodges. Repeated actions that make the walk, roll to Park Rose High School and Middle School the most diverse public high school in the state of Oregon, even riskier for students. It shouldn't take a student's death in one of these crosswalks to reverse course. It shouldn't take unspeakable heartache and lawsuits to seek solutions. The time to take action is now. Mayor, commissioners, make a Park Row students walk, roll to school safer, reverse the Peabot exception, and pull the building permits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we go to our next uh, member of the public, please? Next is Lily Burnett. Welcome, Lily. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Lily Burnett, and I live in the Russell neighborhood of East Portland. I am a working parent in the Park Rose School District. Um, I'm here today to ask City Council to prioritize protecting human life by withdrawing the building permit issued for a 37 bay truck distribution warehouse across the street from our middle and high school. It's on 122nd and already deadly road. I believe in Vision Zero, and I want to raise my children in a city that prioritizes safe routes to schools for all of our students. <laughs> <clears throat> but approving plans to increase um, truck traffic at a street that directly abuts our high school is contradictory to what Vision Zero is all about and contradictory to the guiding principles of equity and accountability. Um, out in East Portland, we often feel ignored by the city. Park Rose and Argay neighborhoods have been characterized as industrial areas meant for a commercial focus, and that um, ignores the over 10,000 people who live there and we're trying to make our neighborhoods better and safer for our children. So I'm asking City Council and Prologis to withdraw the building permit and reconsider allowing a freight warehouse across the street from our schools. I'm asking you to rescind the driveway extension you approved to allow 18 wheelers to access the site from Northeast 122nd, which they couldn't do before. And I'm asking you to withdraw the noise variance you've approved to expedite Prologis' construction by operating concrete trucks at 4.30 in the morning, right next to apartment buildings, during finals weeks for our students. We've had two pedestrian deaths in the last two years on our stretch of 122nd, within blocks of our middle and high school. Increasing truck traffic means it's only a matter of time before a child is struck and killed. That could be my child, and that's not acceptable. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next testimony, please. Next up is David Stein. David's joining us online. Well, oh, hey, David. Welcome. Hi. You thank you. Room. Yeah, good to see everyone again. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Um, I feel like I came to you a little early last week uh, when I started talking about Vision Zero, and I felt it was appropriate to come back um, and just provide some more notes. So um, I am not representing any organization, and I just want to echo my support for uh, Vision Zero and the acceptance of this plan. Um, I'm heartened to see the um, emphasis on cross-bureau collaboration, and I just want to... Um, Send along a few notes. So um, there was some mention about uh, speed cameras. And while those are good, um, I've seen uh, firsthand with the ones on Beaverton Hillsdale that were installed in 2016, that people are very compliant when they know that they're on camera. And then as soon as they're outside of range, you can hear every vehicle speed up or just about. And I, I would um, take out some uh, lawn chairs and sit with anyone who wants to um, at the corner of 3rd and 9th and Beaverton Hillsdale is uh, that they speed up. Um, we also need to find a better way to leverage new development to um, build the types of infrastructure that don't force people into the costly um, expense of um, having a car. 
um, when we talked about Alpenrose last week, um, one of the things that was highlighted is that the infrastructure that's gonna be required for that site is top tier and it connects to nothing. And when we talk about affordability in the city of Portland, when you have to add that um, average expense of a, of a uh, car of about $10,000 onto whatever rent or mortgage payment you're making, that adds up really fast. And so building um, no, new infrastructure that allows people the opportunity to not um, have to have a car, but um, maybe get a transit pass or a bicycle um, <laughs> will, will help keep housing more affordable. And um, some of that's going to mean changing how we do stormwater management in places like Southwest, where it's excessively um, ex expensive to build um, any kind of sidewalks or um, anything beyond a shoulder. Um, we also need to talk about um, driver responsibility and, and training. Um, I got my license over two decades ago. I have not had to take a single test since that point. Or I'm sorry, I had to take one written test when I moved to Oregon and I will never have to take one again. We should change that and we should make that a legislative priority for the next session. And, and finally, wh whenever we look at new modes of transportation like e-scooters, they went through multiple pilots and reports to make sure that they were safe for their users. If we were looking at cars and trying to introduce them to our ecosystem, we wouldn't for a second think about allowing them. I mean, looking at 60 plus deaths, um, the, the climate implications and all the other externalities, um, it just wouldn't be a consideration. So um, I urge the acceptance and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much, David. And I believe we have one more member of the public who would like to address council. We do, we have Kyle Johnson. Welcome, Kyle. Come on up. Uh, hello, counselors. My name is uh, Kyle Johnson. I'm the vice chair of Bike Loud PDX. Our mission is for 25% of all trips in Portland to be made by bike. And I was really happy to hear all the partners and um, work that's going on around Vision Zero. It's really important, to, especially people who ride bikes. I wanted to highlight one of the, the major players who wasn't in the room today and to talk about a specific opportunity that we have to uh, help make a, a street safer. And that's the Oregon Department of Transportation, which controls many of our high crash corridors. Uh, I don't think that they've had anybody come today um, they don't have a Vision Zero plan, and uh, right now we are working, or uh, the Portland Bureau of Transportation is working with ODOT to uh, create a crossing at 79th and Powell. Uh, this is an important neighborhood greenway connection. It sort of runs parallel to 82nd. It's really important for East Portland, increasing bikeability. Um, and right now the ODOT is con in control of the street and so any kind of projects that we do have to get approval from the state. And the state has really different sort of priorities in terms of infrastructure and safety. And so the, the, the project that they're proposing is much uh, substandard to what, would, what PBOT would normally install. And so we'd really like this council's support and help in pushing ODOT to sort of change their culture around safety. And especially at this intersection, uh, we've heard so much about 82nd and the importance of this. Right now, this crossing sort of divides these two really important greenway networks and having a really safe, secure crossing there will be really helpful. We just sent a, a, an email to, to your uh, staff commissioner uh, and would appreciate any kind of like follow-up around that uh, regarding this crossing so thank you very much great um, before you go I've been can I invite uh, uh, my director up um, I could I think read her lips or almost read her lips when you mentioned ODOT yes did you have something you wanted to add there uh, hi. Hey. How's it going? Um, I just wanted to mention that we did uh, reach out to ODOT um, we indicated to them that while we recognize they might not be able to make it today, we want to provide them the opportunity to share some insights on how they Just are supporting recently. Vision Zero. Um, and so I have a few comments from Ryan Winsheimer, who is their Region yeah. 1 area manager, just really briefly. Um, for the record, uh, he wanted to make sure that we did share 
There is significant work that uh, we're doing together on Interpol. I know that that has been the topic of a great deal of discussion over the past many months. Um, there's a $30 million investment, no, a 50, $150 million investment on 82nd, of course, as we've already discussed, and, and many others. So while I know that the letter that you've uh, shared with uh, the commissioner and with the Portland Bureau of Transportation specifically calls out the crossing at 79th and Powell. Um, there is significant work that ODOT is doing. They are committed to ensuring that we're creating safety across the network that we both share and that we are responsible for managing independently. So just wanted to make Thank that. you, Director, and thank you, Kyle. I sure appreciate your feedback today. Um, Colleagues, that is the end, I believe, of our formal presentation. If uh, you have any questions or comments, this would be the time to share them. If not, we can uh, move to a vote. Oh. Sounds like Commissioner Ryan. Oh, I apologize, Commissioner Gonzalez, your hand is up. Do you, do you have some questions, Commissioner Ryan? No, you first. I guess I, I just think uh, the first one might be for PBOT as well as um, Chief from uh, still have them. I, I just, first of all, appreciate the comprehensive report. Um, I want to focus in on the relative risk of impairment and speed. It looks like about seven in 10 deadly crisis, uh, uh, crashes uh, since 2017 were due to impaired drivers. I'm just, I think I'm looking at page 23 of the report, about 69%. And, um, and then nearly eight in 10 injury causing crashes happen in the hands of impaired drivers. Those rates are actually higher than those involving speed. And so I guess one of my questions is, what's our current strategy with respect to impairment uh, uh, from an enforcement perspective? Uh, and if you had an additional 20 police officers, how might you adjust that? Not holding you to it. I just want to see, think about how we flex if we had more law enforcement resources to address the impairment question. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I figure you want me to take this one. I do, and I, I, okay. I, I want to make sure you mention the success of um, St. Patrick's Day weekend when yeah. there was... I was going to lead with that. Okay. I was actually going to ask Perfect. about St. Patrick's Day, Great. so thank All right. you. Yeah, so, I mean, same page. Take a look back uh, to St. Patrick's Day weekend, and I have um, some folks here that worked it uh, with me if they want to come up and add anything to this. Uh, we partnered with agencies both in Multnomah County, Clackamas County, I think we even had some Washington County ones in there, mm. and during that weekend, that just additional focus in areas looking for impaired drivers, we ended up seeing no traffic fatalities in the metro area the entire weekend. Yes, sir. Yes. So if I magically, I mean, the chief is not here, unfortunately, and he's going to hit me on the side of the head if I yeah, say yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to put you in a tough place. But I if, just want to, like, if I If I suddenly had 20 people that were all certified to go do the work that traffic does, we could recreate that on a regular basis. Um, I'm sure there's, um, you know, work to be done in gun violence. There's work to be done in a lot of other areas. But that is what we can do, and we're, we're doing it with partnerships right now. The other thing that I think that we uh, need to continue to work on is building partnerships with OLCC, um, advocating for them down in Salem so that they can staff enough investigators so that they can uh, make sure that um, OLCC establishments are being responsible in serving or not over-serving. Uh, we're still always going to have some people that just, just choose to drink at home and get behind the wheel, but I think a lot of our folks are drinking somewhere uh, before they make that choice. Uh, so that's another that's another route that we can look for for partnerships. And when we look at recent sort of trends, when we talk about impairment, you know, would you ballpark what percentage is alcohol and what percentage is other other drugs uh, for impairment? Not specific percentages, but we can definitely say that there has been a huge rise in drug impaired driving since the legalization of different types of impairing substances. We're definitely seeing a lot more people that are not just impaired by alcohol, but combinations of alcohol and drugs or drugs alone. Got it. I would love, if you had any hard data on that trend, I'd love to see it if that's possible. And we can talk to CSD as well, see what we might be able to parse through. I think that's an interesting question right now because obviously OLCC is one component in what we're doing with bars and for, with restaurants is uh, that's one side of it. We're talking fentanyl or meth. It's a whole different 
a ball of wax and how we might confront that on the front end. Um, any other quick anecdotes on St. Patty's Day? Anything you know that really went well? And I love to hear that we worked with neighboring agencies. That's great, uh, great news. I'd heard about some collaboration, so that that's great. But just generally curious how it went. Sure, we we're trying to be creative with what we've got, and I had heard that there was a traveling Oregon State Police team that was moving around the state to help local agencies when they had big events or popular weekends rodeos, festivals, all kinds of things. And so I reached out to them. They came back in November, brought their whole team for their work week, stayed in a hotel and worked together with us and a few of the agencies for that busy weekend. I think it was one full weekend before Thanksgiving. And then we made the plan from there to start reaching out and getting more groups together. We now meet on a monthly basis and try and have monthly missions around the metro area surrounding DUI in the evenings or speeding and distracted driving during the day. And we planned that St. Patrick's Day event where we had, I think it was 14 agencies that were participating within their own areas, but then OSP was traveling through the whole area. They brought lots of resources into town. They had mobile intoxilizer machines in cars instead of having to take someone to a precinct, sped up the process. And we saw lots of results from that weekend, lots of positive results on a very popular, busy, sunny weekend. So we are going to continue to do that. And we have already started plans for, I believe it's the last weekend in June where we're going to do the same thing and bring everybody back together again and have a DUI focused mission uh, at that time as well. Got it. And then turning to speed, the, the speed side of it, um, I think there's a lot of optimism for red light and speeding cameras uh, to uh, disrupt a certain percentage of the population that's, in, that's speeding. Um, but then we have the challenge of those without plates and, um, you know, for those listening at home, just to emphasize the point that they don't have plates. We can't bust them with a with a speed camera. Um, what what do we what do we do about that? I mean, what's current plan, and what are the is there policy questions for council to consider? You know, as we we confront that part of the speeding problem. An important part of Vision Zero and the efforts that we put forth is to make sure that we're being equitable when it comes to enforcement and education and. Concerns were raised over the past years about issuing unfair amount of citations for people that maybe can't afford their registration or their, their licensing fees and things of that sort. Uh, we have not made it an, uh, a policy that our officers cannot stop somebody for expired tags or no plate or something like that, but we do ask our officers to try and look for the dangerous driving behaviors primarily. Um, they still are able to stop people for those types of violations. Um, but mostly if they're stopping people for dangerous driving behavior, speeding and distracted driving and running red lights, and they come across somebody without a license plate as well, they can take proper actions to make sure they get that taken care of, issue them a citation or a fix it ticket or something like that, that doesn't negatively impact them as much or target low economic portions of our community. So we're doing our best to focus on dangerous driving behaviors, but we are also watching for those other violations, such as the no plates and things too. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's, it comes up a level as a policy question for council and others in leadership positions. How do we get the barrier, economic barriers to having plates and tags removed? How do we address sort of the potential for disparate impacts amongst you know marginalized groups in general? as best we can at a policy level and still fully empower law enforcement to um, address folks who are uh, driving without plates. Because right now, you know, <laughs> it's a tale of two stories. You drive without plates, you can speed through a, you know, a, a camera. And if you have plates, you're going to get busted. And that's, that's not sustainable as a community indefinitely. I think there was a bit of a culture change that came during COVID where DMVs were backed up so far. People started being a little more lenient on consequences for not having that. I can tell you as somebody who just registered my car last week that it was a pretty darn fast process, but it's expensive. And so there is an economic barrier, but it's, not, it's no longer a time barrier. DMV has been able to get those time frames down quite a bit that it's no longer 
hard to get your <laughs> license instated. And Commissioner, if I may add, um, the numbers that we have regarding those who have unregistered vehicles um, is pretty um, significant. 45% of vehicles in um, the city of Portland, and that's a combination of cars and trailers and, and um, campers and, and motorcycles and everything. Um, Say 45%. 45. 45 percent and so 45 percent of the people do not live in spaces that um, uh, uh, would be deemed as um, places where there is significant economic hardship it's 45 percent and um, like uh, uh, Sergeant uh, Ingstrom I too just recently went to uh, register my vehicle not an insignificant sum didn't take very long I went during lunch and and got it done and um, but I wanted to make sure that I avoided the ticket that I knew that uh, the parking enforcement officers would <laughs> issue to me uh, if, in fact, I had not registered my car. But 45% of people are unregistered. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and so we are intentional about making sure that we're paying attention when we identify those vehicles. People are given warnings um, to be able to go and do the fix-it uh, that they need to. Um, when we are finding um, repeat offenses, uh, at least in terms of vehicles that are parked that do not have tags. We seek out the option of identifying those owners and giving them some uh, choices to make around how they can bring themselves into compliance or remove the car from the right of way. Um, but um, of course, we're not uh, necessarily dealing with the moving vehicles, although we are responsible for helping to support the, the cameras. But it's, it is a, it's, a, it's a significant challenge. And as has been mentioned, um, the, the pandemic did make a significant impact on people's behaviors in general. Um, we're working together to bring things back into a, a range of normalcy and um, creating the opportunity for folks to uh, demonstrate uh, their commitment to also creating safer communities. Got it. I, I only have two more questions for now. On looks like positive trends on bicycle deaths, if I read it correctly, is what what is working in that area? What you said positive trends or? I thought we saw a decline in bicycle deaths. Decline, death. yeah. decline in bicycle yeah. deaths. Positive is in going down. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Bicycle deaths tend to be relatively low numbers, so a difference between year to year, I wouldn't necessarily call that a trend. Um, in general, some of the investments that we have made in protected bike lanes and greenways and bicycle facilities, I think, are increasing safety. We do still have a ways to go, but those numbers are relatively small overall. So no reason to celebrate yet. Exactly. It, it's, it's, it could be a blip. Well, if I could jump yeah. in here on the on the um, on the bicycle death uh, um, piece, um, although I don't know if we have a trend uh, graph in here. One thing which Portland should be really proud of it's it's quite it's not uncommon for us to get through a year with zero. Um, bike fatalities, um, and this, that's partly a tribute to uh, the wisdom of our bike riders and our, the folks behind vehicles, and also just the incredible work Peabot has done in terms of making um, a multimodal transportation system a reality here in Portland. But any traffic uh, um, death is too many, obviously, and our goal is zero. Well, for sure, no, and I, I just call it as there was at least the potential for a positive trend yeah, there. And sure. I, I do acknowledge we're talking Heck, low numbers now. Two, year, two deaths is actually kind of a bad year in the, in the bike space for us. It. it is important to note that cycling in general overall has increased in the past year in the city, which is a positive sign. Um, we are excited about the opportunity to continue to create safety in um, the, the bike um, facilities that we're creating or that we're building. Um, we're... Uh, intentional right now about making sure that we go back to some of the places where we made some temporary improvements and hardening those facilities to create greater safety, greater separation for those who are cycling. Um, uh, Director Oliveira mentioned the diverters that you see on certain uh, roadways that keep people from making lefts or uh, passing through and uh, making uh, direct uh, linkage from one side of a street to another. 
those are the types of things that are supporting um, ensuring that the safety for cyclists is there. Our uh, city traffic engineer, Wendy Colley, is here. She can speak to some of the ways that we're working to improve that network. And, and when you improve the network for cyclists, you're improving it for everyone. Uh, you're creating a safer environment for everyone. That is what we've um, identified. And while we recognize that sometimes those improvements can be controversial, um, we are seeing differences in the ways that people are behaving, people are responding, and people are accessing the system. Sorry, you just added one more question because I still have <laughs> one and a half questions left. So on this point, you know, we heard earlier today some testimony on uh, really an embrace of greenways um, yes. uh, for cyclists. You know, it, it's felt in my adult lifetime that appetite for greenways has fluctuated even inside of the cycling community as to, you know, is that the, and I think it was building off of a question Commissioner Ryan was asking, you know, if you have a greenway here and a, a roadway here, what's what's optimal to push them on the street where we have a lot of different users or to push, you know, the, the, the cycling on the greenway. And I, I, it feels like in recent years, sometimes the cycling community has really been critical of driving some of that to the, to greenways that they want to push multimodular, uh, on some of our roadways. What's PBOT's current policy approach to that? Like what's the, what's the standard philosophy on that question? I don't know that there is a standard philosophy um, with every opportunity that we have, especially when we're making sweeping change. And I'm going to ask Wendy to come up because I don't want to misstate any of the uh, elements around how we design and, and plan for traffic um, management in the city. Uh, but there is no cookie cutter, um, do this or that. Um, with each uh, significant change, especially using Hawthorne as an example, mm -hmm. uh, there uh, were at some point considerations of us using uh, Hawthorne and creating bike lane bike facilities on that roadway. The choice was made by the Bureau and by the commissioner in charge at that time to uh, not make that change, uh, not uh, through the, um, the business heavy uh, uh, parts mm -hmm. of, of Hawthorne um, and that there are greenways on either side of it. Um, some people agree with that. Some people disagree. That's, um, I think, uh, probably the foundation of the nature of our business is that we uh, wake up every morning looking for the opportunity to try to bring people closer together. But there are just differences of opinion. But as it relates to the standards, according to METCD and, and all the other guides that you use. Wendy, what would you like to share? Please help right. me. Thank you. Wendy Colley, city traffic engineer. Um, I think the question was, how do we determine if we're uh, asking people to use a greenway versus providing facilities on some of our main roadways? Is yeah. That, yeah. It, it really depends. Um, and, and I think a lot of that, um, most of it is attributed to our transportation system plan where we have identified which corridors are key for cycling or transit or pedestrian. Sometimes our biggest roadways um, place a high priority on all modes of transportation. So that's when we're starting to have conversations with community about what's important to them, what's important to the advocates, things like that. On Hawthorne, it turns out that transit was a higher priority than bicycling um, on, on portions of, of Hawthorne. That, led, fed our decision on what happened on Hawthorne. It also feeds our decision on what um, type of facility, you know, we either uh, improve or direct folks to. So that's outlined in our transportation system plan. And then, um, did you want me to speak to types of sure. facilities? Um, uh, the things that we're doing um, for bicycle safety, uh, we are protecting bike facilities more often than not. As our director mentioned, we're improving some of the more plastic types of infrastructure, the plastic wands that you see out there, improving those with um, concrete. But the real goal is providing separation either in space or time between not only bicyclists and automobiles, but pedestrians and automobiles. And we're doing that through a lot of signal timing. These days, you'll see separate signal phases for people who are turning right, so they're not conflicting with pedestrians or bicyclists. We also have separate phases for transit to provide them with um, faster opportunities to get through intersections. So those are some of the tools that we're using today. Well, I, I just want to commend Commissioner Maps and you all for your leadership in this area. This is a difficult area. Sometimes you hear conflicting views even within the <laughs> as to what's the right answer here. And I, it's dizzying just trying to keep up as to what's the trend of the month on in that respect and what's more sustainable uh, as a way to approach this. Last question, I just want to make sure I heard this correctly. Pedestrian deaths... 50% last year were in the houseless community? Yes. 
I mean, that's a number that we need to think seriously about. Um, and I appreciated the, the graph highlighting some of the things that are outside of Piedmont's control that influence our outcomes here. Uh, thank you for my. Thank you. Yeah, jump in. Please. Hi. Um, thanks for being here, all of you. The, the collaboration between the bureaus uh, was noticed and really felt good. And it seemed um, like it's current and that you all really do this. I'm not saying every presentation feels like you collaborated right before and that's what we get to see, but this one I really did notice that it's been ongoing and the community partners as well that are here. I appreciate that a lot. I, I tend to just do the, some dialogue about things that might not have been lifted enough and I think that we need to discuss them. And you, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, touched on most of them. So, um, so that's good. Um, I do think the trends that we saw in the graph here, it said we're the same as everybody else, but we're not at the at the end of this when you look at pedestrian deaths. We, we stick out. And I think there's some underlying causes to that that have been mentioned. But I think we need to go deeper into understanding why. And so I know I brought it up, you know, it sounds so scary when you say the metal examiner, the coroner, but we need real data on why people are dying. Yes, they were hit by the car, but we can assume with some of the data that it's because um, they're impaired while walking. And um, it's sad. This is a sad topic. It's uncomfortable. And I think that's why we don't talk about it enough. I drive in areas that have a lot of people who are homeless that um, appear to be um, in their own world with um, jumping in, in front while I'm driving in Old Town, doing a dance, um, don't want to trigger patient trying to be as trauma informed while I'm moving sure. through the neighborhood. Um, but bless their heart, like they're, 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 I'm just thinking, are they going to be one of these um, statistics by the end of the day? And so are we, are we getting that data on why, why people are dying? Like what, what their blood level, what their blood count is. We didn't have, let's, let's be honest here. When we launched this a decade ago, we didn't have fentanyl. We didn't have the poisonous drugs that we have on our streets today. So how are we adapting to the reality of what the conditions are today that were different when we started this report? This is a good example. I'm not hearing enough about that. I believe the, the police bureau, bureau is happy to um, provide some insight. And, Here we go. And, and Chief Gillespie, I think um, perhaps in, as it relates to the response Here that you question. provide in general on a daily basis. I think some of the ways that his uh, team members, the fire service is showing up um, can help to support um, the response to the question that you have. And then Dana, you might want to come back up. I, I'm judging from the body language, I thought Engstrom might, might have wanted yes, to jump in here. Bureau. Yes. Sure. Do you want to jump in here? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, two things, two asterisks that are going to go next to a lot of these numbers is Usually when we report some numbers and some statistics, this is kind of an uh, at least number. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand if we're saying that over 15 or over 50 percent of the pedestrians who died were experienced houselessness, it's at least that. There's some others that we couldn't prove exactly where they're living or we don't have enough next of kin that can say, oh yeah, he was at that apartment. We can't confirm that. And the same thing goes for intoxication. If a pedestrian dies and the medical examiner is able to determine the cause of death without doing a toxicology, then they're just gonna determine the cause of death from whatever injury it was. We don't always get information back as to the blood alcohol content or the number and level of drugs that were in the system of that individual when they died. And if we do get it back from somebody who's died, we usually get it back years mm. later, not days or months, years later. So again, when we say that X number of pedestrians who died were under the influence of intoxicants, it's at least, it's going to be greater than that. I've been to hundreds of fatal crashes and seen some horrific things. And the vast majority of these crashes that we go to, whether or not we can prove it in the end or get the results from the lab or not, the majority of them involve intoxicants one way or another from one party or the other, or sometimes both. That's so it's a it's an epidemic. It's it is. it's some serious uh, 
usage of drugs and alcohol on our roadways that are absolutely impacting. One of our last fatals was somebody that was experiencing uh, as a pedestrian in the roadway, hunched over, experiencing uh, on the verge of an overdose from fentanyl when they got hit. Thank you for this honest dialogue. We can do better. So we have to figure out how it doesn't take years. Multnomah County, it's great to have you here. You're the authority on public health. This is a public health crisis. And so how can we knit together the public health crisis that is the poisonous drugs that are the influence on why someone got killed? Um, yes, the car or whatever hit them, but they would not have probably darted out into the street. It's just, a lot of, this is relatable to I know a lot of people, because that's what I hear when I talk to your average Portlander, that they feel as though they're doing the best they can. They're not complaining about reduced speed limits. They're, they have to use a car to get around because they have a kid drop off and they have an appointment here. And so in our transit system, stay tuned for that question. It, it's just, it's frustrating. And so if we don't have dialogue that gets into the underneath the hood here about car reference, sorry. Um, if we don't dig deeper into this dialogue, we're just not going to get to the truth. Therefore, we won't be able to get to some solutions. Commissioner so sometimes Ryan. with this report, you're all working really hard. I'm rooting for you. No one up here wants anyone to die. So we're all rooting for this vision zero to actually be zero. But if we don't have dialogue like this, we're not going to get to the truth of how we can improve. And I think sometimes we we brush over it. That's my frustration. But I can add that Multnomah County has started doing they some have started that? Some reporting related to toxicology. So they have the medical examiner. That's not something that we get, as Sergeant Eggstrom said. Um, some of the data is protected by HIPAA laws and other things, but they are starting to aggregate some of that data to have a better understanding. And we have a monthly meeting with public health staff where we're sharing that data. Good. We don't have answers for how we're going to deal with all of those things, but at least we are really starting to dig into that and to try to understand the relationships between all of these things that are happening out of our streets and how it's contributing to these preventable deaths. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. for Commissioner, I, I just want to share, um, I'm not sure if it was you, Dana, or Clay, um, said we are doing hard work and heart work. So this is incredibly um, heart-wrenching yes. work that our people are doing every day. Um, we get the reports every day uh, about what's happening in, in our city. And the demonstration of the partnership that you see here today is not something that we uh, ginned up last week. Rather, it is something that um, has been a longstanding effort and what we are hoping uh, to have as an outcome of this conversation today with you is this broader understanding of what the needs are, um, um, uh, I think an, an increased interest in ensuring that we are doing what we say, um, that we hold us accountable to making sure that we're making the improvements, uh, that we're having the conversations, that we're um, supporting the collaboration that's necessary to help us all to change the way that this conversation is happening, to change the line. It should not be continuing to go off the page in an, in, at, at an increased rate, but rather we have an opportunity to um, work together to change that narrative. And it's not just the narrative, but the outcomes and the way that we are dealing with the problems. And it starts with acknowledging we have a problem. Uh, so um, that's not something that we're afraid to say. We recognize we have one, and so this Thank is why you. we do the work. And the other challenge and problem that I didn't hear discussed today is that, and I've had good conversations with the head of TriMet, Sam Dinsu. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, great guy. Um, I remember when I reached out to him a year ago on this topic, he was found it very refreshing that a city commissioner wanted to talk about safety. Um, full disclosure, my spouse takes uh, Max every day. They um, get on in North Portland on Yellow Line and go out to the David Douglas School District out in Gateway. And that's been going on for three years. I feel like a worried parent, to be honest with you, um, because there's incidents on the max that's very uncomfortable. And unfortunately, when they get on early in the morning, they're one of the few people that are paying to take the max. It's our largest shelter for homeless people in our market. We all know that. We don't talk about it a lot. And um, my point is, there's no information here on the fact that less, fewer and fewer commuters are using Max, fewer commuters are using TriMet in general. Is that true? 
I don't want to um, assert that I know what the data is. Okay. I, I know what the reports it, it's, say. It's gone down, and we know that. But I, I, I think it needs to be crosswalked with this because there's fewer and fewer people taking it. And therefore, I think that's pushing more people into other modes of transportation, whether it's bike or car. And I do think that has an impact. And it's also embarrassing for a city that says we're you know, all into transit, and yet the number one reason people aren't taking it when I listen is because of safety. So when they have debates about fare increases, fine, have that equity issue. But the real equity issue is the working class people in my neighborhood or out in East Portland don't feel safe taking it, and they don't have money to do anything else, to take any other modes of transportation. So they're forced to take it, and we're not protecting their lives very well. And so I just wanted to raise that because it's a sore subject for me. And I feel like we've been really slow to respond to transit safety in our community. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we do have a transit component at Peabody, it's streetcar, and we recognize that we have an opportunity and an obligation to ensure that our riders, as well as those that are taking uh, TriMet, uh, using TriMet as an option, do feel safe. I have had conversations with the streetcar staff and leadership about First of all, operator safety and how, how safe they feel. Um, what we're doing at platforms. Hats off to all of them. Uh, they yeah. They do the hard work. They, <laughs> they, they do the hard work. Um, and and we, we need to make a greater investment to ensure that um, people feel safe at the platforms, people feel safe riding. Our ridership is actually quite high right now on both um, the, the lines that on we the run. On streetcar. On streetcar. On the yes. west side. Both, both sides, actually. Uh, depending on time of day, but uh, definitely on the west side. So, um, but one of the things that one of the officers shared with me is, I don't have as much help as I need. I can't do as much as I, I need to, uh, to ensure that uh, folks feel safe. And they also need to uh, have the opportunity to protect as um, rigorously as they need to. They, they go with a, a flashlight and a a few other things. So I'm not suggesting that uh, they should have access to more um, uh, robust uh, tools to um, curb behavior, but at least have a partner, uh, if, if nothing else, so that we can ensure that uh, they're safe while ensuring the safety of those who are riding the system. So it is, it is a, a concern that we keep front and center uh, all the time. And so the, the public health crisis that is addictions and that is the fentanyl crisis and other um, hard drugs. Just read about another one that's like way more poisonous than fentanyl, can you imagine? So the fact is we have to keep lifting this dialogue up and how it impacts what we're looking at today. And so I, I hope that there's a way that we can get deeper into the data and see how it impacts the, the numbers that we're looking at today. And again, we're all rooting for this to, to improve in the, other, in the right direction. But I think it's really important that we have the uncomfortable conversations about some other line um, impacts that sometimes, in my opinion, don't get expressed in these reports. Thank so you. I appreciate all of you being present with this conversation. And Absolutely. you can add anything else you'd like. I will just add one more thing. I don't think it's helpful. Sometimes I feel a tone of car shaming. And I know a lot of people that um, would love, again, to take transit. They would love to have a different style to get around. But like when I lived in New York, I, didn't never, I never thought of taking a car, right? Uh, when I lived in Seattle, for the most part, I didn't have a car. I found it increasingly more challenging to get around Portland and be all on time without having that vehicle. And so I think that we have to um, be in this together and look at the deeper conditions that are causing some of our challenges with pedestrian deaths and not have the old model of 10 years ago, which I think was probably the car versus bike. I just think we need to evolve. And for that, I hope that the data continues to improve. I want to hear more about what we do with the data. So when we have a beginning of a, a plan 10 years ago, it always means you have to do a lot of recalibration after you look at the data. And it sounds like you're doing that, but I want to continue to hear those stories, how you as cross bureaus are working together to have new strategies, to actually see how those impacts, those <laughs> strategies impact an improvement in the data and get rid of the ones that aren't having any positive impact. That's what, uh, that's what we do. It's called continuous improvement. And I find government can be really slow to accept something that's been really popular in, in the market for a long time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any more questions or comments? If not, this is a resolution, so we can call the roll. Ryan. 
Oh, God. After you do that, you're like, OK, now do I say? Um, I want to just say a few things, and that is I really did, appre I did appreciate the collaboration. And Director Williams, that says a lot about your leadership. This report felt different this year because of that. And so I applaud the um, collaborative spirit that you're operating in. And I also didn't, uh, I also felt like there was not defensiveness as much as we're doing heart and hard work. And we have to continue to do that because that's what it's like when you're a public servant in 2024. The credit goes to the team. Uh, I, the credit goes to the team. I just have the opportunity to provide the leadership. So um, it's, it's so my Dana and her team. And there they are. They're Anna. smiling. Yeah big smiles. And I um, hope that we just continue to get um, deeper into the conditions that are causing some of the impacts and that Portlanders just know that this uh, public health crisis and addiction crisis that we're in is having a lot of impact on the challenges of getting Vision Zero. We have a long ways to go and let's continue to use this um, annual discussion as an opportunity to improve and we all would love to be here the day where we see zero fat fatalities. So anyway, thanks so much. That's an aye. What's that? Oh, I have to say aye. I accept the report. Thank you, Commissioner Mapps. Sure. Aye. aye. Gonzalez. Uh, I just want to thank again, Commissioner Mapps and the whole PBOT team for bringing this forward today. Uh, really robust discussion. Uh, some difficult societal issues we're dealing with in transportation that uh, carries over to a lot of different things, including transportation. Um, but uh, looking forward to the city uh, one day having a, a level zero year. And uh, I think we'll work together on it uh, across a lot of different bureaus. So I vote aye. Maps. Um, I, let me start out by thanking the mayor uh, for co-sponsoring uh, this resolution with me. It's a symbol of the partnership that uh, embodies this space. I also want to thank Director Williams for her leadership. My whole PBOT team does amazing work in this space every day. Uh, I, I feel deeply, deep gratitude to um, all the bureau directors, our partners from the county, and our partners from the community who came and testified uh, today and worked with us on a daily basis to help keep our streets um, safe. Also very much appreciate the um, public uh, feedback we got today uh, during comments. I hear you, uh, Park Rose folks. I pledge that we will continue to work with you to try to keep your kids and your roadways safe. Um, I'll remind you that this is, re is a report um, and uh, I'm gonna wrap up by highlighting some numbers in this report that I hope that we all think about. Uh, one number is zero. That's our goal in terms of the number of traffic fatalities. Another number is 69. That's how many traffic fatalities we had last year. Another number that we should all be thinking about is 69%. Um, that is the percentage of our traffic fatalities that involved someone or both parties who were under the influence of drug or alcohol. Uh, another number that we should be thinking about right now is 42%. And uh, those are the number of, tra or the percentage of traffic fatalities which involve speed. Uh, you should also think about this percentage, 34%. Uh, th that is the percentage of um, our traffic fatalities which involve pedestrians. And as we heard today, half of those pedestrian fatalities involve a houseless person. That is deeply disturbing. Um, another number we should think about, uh, 35. That's the number of specific steps contained in our report that we will move forward with, which will help us uh, bend the curve on traffic fatalities. And I want to leave you with one last number, colleagues. And that number is 35 million. And that is roughly what the structural deficit my team over at PBOT is facing right now as we try to craft our budget for the next fiscal year. And I want to remind you, um, uh, the evidence we've seen today is where PBOT is able to go out and install traffic cameras, install speed bumps, install better lighting. We can make a difference. It's hard to make a difference, though, when... Right now, you know, these people that you see around me are spending their days and nights trying to figure out how to um, keep the system running and make the system safer as we reduce um, the resources that we have to work with. Given all of that, um, I very much appreciate the discussion uh, that we've had today and the work that our friends do in this field. I vote aye.
We just wanted to correct the record that this is a resolution and not a report. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Rubio? Um, I want to thank Director Williams and Dana and all the presenters, um, the resolution and the data, um, the, re the presentation. <laughs> and the data were both alarming and it was hopeful, too. Um, and also a clear reminder about where our responsibilities are in this work. Um, I also want to lift up and appreciate the cross-bureau collaboration. That was really great to see, and I agree, agree with the comments from my colleagues that um, this was a really uh, great um, evolution of presentation from years before. Um, we also need to continue to push forward here and where we can do more when it comes to investing in these uh, meaningful strategic uh, in infrastructure um, improvements that were discussed today. Um, and uh, finally, I just really want to lift up all the numerous city staff and first responders and the advocates and community members that continue to invest hundreds of hours in dialogue about these very issues um, into planning, into implementation um, of all these strategies. Um, and it, it really does give me hope that we will get to total elimination one day. Um, we can't become numb to these issues, so that's why it's important that we're here um, and that we're that we're keeping the, the conversations going. Uh, finally, appreciate the leadership of Commissioner Maps. Thank you, Commissioner Maps, um, as well as uh, Director Williams and the community for taking up this charge. So, uh, good work here. I vote aye. Wheeler. Uh, that was a good report. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was very substantive. I appreciated hearing not only from our PBOT uh, director and associates, but also from the other partners as well. I think it gives us sort of a bigger picture view of what's going on. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Uh, I'm very happy to support this resolution. I vote aye. Great. Um, Mr. Rear, do you want to run the show here? I think we have one more item to vote on today. Um, we have one more administrative item, colleagues. Uh, Rebecca, if you could read item 320, please. Amend city code to update existing public camping restriction policies. Uh, colleagues, as you know, today we were planning on bringing forward a camping ordinance. This would be a an ordinance that would supplant the one that we had passed earlier that has been enjoined by the courts. We were to present what I believe is a legally defensible, clear, accountable, and immediate strategy. Uh, however, um, we also understand that Commissioner Gonzalez has put forth an alternative proposal. Uh, there is a strong interest on the part of the majority of the council to thoroughly vet that counter proposal. And for that reason, uh, I would like to uh, reschedule item 320, which was supposed to be heard, I'm sorry, tomorrow afternoon, Thursday afternoon. I'd like to reschedule 320 to April 24th, the following week at 4 p.m. time certain. And uh, the reason we want to reschedule it today rather than tomorrow is it was the only item on the agenda. So due to the rescheduling of this item, the April 18th afternoon session tomorrow is hereby canceled. Thank you all. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.